Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to read uh, from 1 to 14. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you. Let me made uh, among you. Okay. As is fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. What we need to understand here, folks, is very simple. That Ephesians is written to a group of Gentile converts. Now, there are, again, as I've shared with you before, there are many Jewish people in these churches, in these cities that Paul went to. The first thing he went to was the synagogues, and there he would share the love of Christ. He had a, a connection there with the Jewish people. He had a connection as a far, former uh, Pharisee. He had a connection that he could reach out to them and speak to them. But there were many people in the, these churches that he established that were Gentiles, who were not born into a Jewish faith, who were not born into a faith whatsoever. In fact, many of them uh, were involved in what we would call today occult practices. Many of them to today, they were involved in things that are shameful, as Paul talks about here, even to speak about them in public. But Paul is literally reaching out to these people who once were in a sinful lifestyle but now they've come to Christ how they're supposed to live as Christians. Now, I'm telling you, it takes time for a person who's been involved in sinful activity, going to their quote-unquote temples, going to their, their quote-unquote places of worship, and being involved in horrible sinful things that the Bible calls uh, things that just are not mentionable. But in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse one, he says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. He said, look, I don't want you to imitate the world. I don't want you to imitate the things of the world. I want you to imitate God. So how do we imitate God? How are we to be imitators of God? Well, in verse two, it talks about and walk in love as Christ also has loved us. We're not just to walk in any type of love but we're to walk as Christ had walked in it, that we're to live as Christ lived in it. And so we see that Paul is, is literally, he is speaking to these, to these Ephesian Christians and he's saying to them, you need to love like Christ. That's how we're to be imitators of God. And then in verse eight of this same chapter, he talks about walking as children of light. Not only are we to be children of the love of God or the love of Christ, but we're also to be children of the light. Now, what does that mean? We'll see about that in a little bit. So why are we to do this? Back in verse 1, it says, as dear children. What does that mean? Children imitate their parents in many occasions, some to the chagrin of their parents, some to the, to the joy of their parents. But we're seeing here that he says, I want you to do these things, to be imitators of God as dear children. We are a part of God's family. We have been adopted into the family of God. We're no longer in the world of, 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 uh, of sinister sin and things of that nature, but rather we are children 
of the light. We are children of God. Amos 3, 3 says, how can two walk together unless they are agreed? And so what it means is if we're going to walk with God, we need to agree with God. Now, you say, well, that's simple. Yeah, it is. It's simple, but it's very difficult to do. Because there's a lot of things that are, that, are, that are upon our hearts that literally pull us from the things of God. There are family traditions. There are things of our own nature, our own society, our own wicked self that we have to fight and deal with each and every day that cause us not to be in agreement with God. And we can walk not with God in those times. So how do I agree with God? Again, in verse 2, it talks about walking in love. First John 1, 6 says, This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. John says, this is how we walk in love. How is that? We follow the things that God has given us. Okay, you have the Bible. Many of you have at least one Bible. And I would, I would recommend anybody to have a Bible. I, I think it's important. We have these little Bibles out front to give out to people. Listen, folks, these are dynamite. These, these are absolutely dynamite. These will change the lives of people. I have, heard, I have heard testimonies from a lot of people getting these Bibles, not just this one, but other Bibles uh, that the Gideons hand out. One guy in prison, he would take a Gideon Bible every time a Gideon would come through because he liked the paper. They had real thin little paper. And he said to the Gideon person, why do you like the thin paper? He says, I can roll up cigarettes with them. And so the guy says, oh my, what happened? He says, well, there was one day I decided before I would smoke it, I would read it. I'd read this paper. He said, I began to read this page, and it talked about the love of God. And I said, I can't burn this up. And he said, I began to read the Bible and began to touch my heart, and I got saved. Now, folks, that's what this Bible is. It is absolutely a weapon of sin destruction. It really is. And so what we need to know is that we need to walk in love. And how do we do that? By walking according to his word. And then in verse 8, how are we to agree with God? We're, walk, we're to walk as children of light. Now, you know, that's important. Now, the whole concept of, of light versus darkness is very interesting. Because you see, if you have darkness, if you walk in darkness, you can step in a pothole. You can step in something in, uh, in the trail of a, of a woods or wherever you're at, and you can break a leg. You can literally hurt yourself. So what you have to do is you have to have a little light. The light helps you. And so the whole aspect of the Bible is, is the analogy that the Bible is our light for our life. And so we see we're to walk as children of light. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Oh, folks, listen to me. Each and every one of you, more than likely, I hope I should say, I hope you have a flashlight in your home. But those of you have a flashlight. And the question is, why? Why do you have a flashlight? So that when the light goes out, you have the light. And that's why I tell people I have more than one Bible. And they say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, let me ask you a question. How many screwdrivers in your garage? And the guy said, well, I, got, I said, you got more than one? Well, yes, I do. Well, this is my tool. This is my, my uh, screwdrivers, okay? So understand that that Bible is very important to you. And as we walk with it, we walk in the light. We agree with God by reading God's word and applying it to our lives. This is how we walk with him. This is what he's telling the Ephesians. He's saying, look, you cannot live for God and go and do the things you used to do. Those things you used to do, he said, that are unmentionable. Now, I can't imagine. I'm telling you, we live in a world that things are, are basically just thrown out there for everybody to see. There's not a whole lot hidden in the darkness. But I'd hate to think what is actually in the darkness, what's done behind the closed door, so to speak. There are things in this world that would, I, I keep saying this, that if you knew what was going on, you'd crawl underneath your bed and you wouldn't come out for three weeks. The bottom line is simple, folks. We're to walk in the light, the light of God. 
So let's, let's look at our text tonight. First of all, we see in verses 1 through 7 that we are to walk in his love. Oh, I tell you, I, I love when I grew up as a child, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that my mom and dad loved me. I remember on many occasions, I, 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 as a child, you don't, you don't understand. As a child, you don't get it. But as an adult, you remember things and you begin to think, oh my. I remember there are times when my mom and dad didn't have meat on their plates, but I did. And I understood that my mom and dad loved me, cared for me for that. And that's why they did it. And so let me say this to you folks. There are things we don't get now. In, in our Christian life as we walk, we're like children sometimes. We need to understand that God truly loves us. So we see this application of his love in verse 1 and 2, the imitation of God in verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. Oh, folks, we need to live how God would have us to live. And how do we know that? God the Father is seated in heaven. God the Father is on the throne in heaven. No one in this room has ever seen God. The Bible says no man sees God and lives. That means, really what it means is if you're going to see the face of God, you're going to be dead in this world. You're going to be in heaven to see the face of God. And so what we see is in verse 1, we're to live as children of God. Psalm 9, verse 23, or excuse me, Luke 9, verse 23 says, And then he said to them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What does that mean? That means to deny ourselves. We're to be imitation of God. We're to do what God would have us to do, not what John would have us to do. Years ago, we used to have a a little uh, a band, a little plastic band that said WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, I took it very personal because not only was it important for me to know what Jesus would do, but what would John do? Okay, I know what Jesus would do, but the question really wasn't what Jesus would do. The question is, what would John do? Okay, and so therein lies the issue. We know, as Christians, we know the truth. But the real, the real factor of growing in Christ is, what would we do? What are we going to do? And so we deny himself. Know who I really am. I'm a changed person. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of the King. I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ, just as you are. Romans 8, 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. We are sons of God. We are daughters of God. We are children of God. And we need to live like it. Now that means a new walk. That means a new direction. That means a whole new lifestyle. There are things we used to do. I love what uh, the... Uh, Adrian Rogers, who, who went home to be with the Lord, but Adrian Rogers used to have people say to him, you Baptists think you can do anything you want to do and still go to heaven. And old Adrian Rogers said, no, that's not true. You know, the truth of it is very simple. When I got saved, I got a new one -er. A what? A new one -er. What's that? He said, I don't want to do that anymore. These are things I don't want to do. As Christians, we need to walk on the path of God, we need to walk in the light of Christ. And so we need to, first of all, deny ourselves. It's not what I want. It's not what I need. It's what God would have for me. And then we need to have a daily sacrifice. That's cross-bearing. That's dying to ourself. In Galatians chapter 2, turn a little bit to your left, to Galatians chapter 2. In fact, that's the next book over. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Paul is writing to the church of Galatia, and he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. He said, listen, folks, I need to walk in Christ. I need to be 
walking the same path that Jesus walks. I need to do the same things that Jesus do. And the question really is, what would Jesus do? That's what we ask ourselves. That's what we need to do as we walk down the path of life and we see a, a turn in the road. Is this what Jesus would take? Is this where Jesus would go? There's where we have to make the decision. That's when in our life we need to say, I'm not going there anymore. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not going that direction anymore because Jesus wouldn't have me to go there. So there's a daily sacrifice, dying to yourself. And then there's a directional service. You see, our devotion to follow Christ is a part of our lifestyle. Years ago, I used to have a friend. I ended up leading him to the Lord. He's with the Lord now in heaven. But he used to, when I'd go over to his house, he'd always introduce me to his friends. It was back in the 70s. And this is my Jesus freak friend, John. And I'd say, John, I'm, I'm not a Jesus freak. I'm just a child of God. And every, every day he'd offer me, every day I'd go there, every time I'd go there, uh, can I get you a beer? And of course he'd say it for all his friends. I said, no, thank you. I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't drink, John. And he said, that's okay. I just wanted to see your face. So anyway, he, he would do that. And, and then what he said was very simple. He says, why don't you drink? And I told him one time, I said, you know, I don't do it because I have to not do it. I do it because I don't want, I don't do it because I don't want to do it. I want to follow Jesus. I want to be like him. So we see the imitation of God next in verse 2. The Bible says, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. There's a lot of, of Greek words for the name of love. I shared this just a while ago. I said, you know, the word love is, in the English language, a strange word. I can, I can tell you I love my mother, but I can tell you also I love my wife. Those are two different loves, aren't they? Yeah, I can tell you also I love chocolate cake. I can also tell you I love peach pie, but I can also tell you I don't love my cat I used to have. <laughs> There's different loves in all of that, right? It means different things. But we see this love here that is talking about and walk in love. What is that love in the Greek? That's agape love. That's godly, benevolent love. You are walking in the steps of Jesus. You are following the path of Christ. You are living in a love that matters more than anything else. That means you forgive. That means you give up your own self-righteousness. You give up your rights. You follow Christ. We see to live lives for God's glory is to walk in the love of Christ. That's the instruction of the Lord. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. Now what does that mean in verse 2? It means that's the instructions of the Lord. To walk in love as Christ has loved us. And then we see the instruction of our lives also in verse 2. The Bible says an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. That speaks of the sacrifices of the Old Testament that God would have a sacrifice and he would smell the smoke of the sacrifice and it was to him a sweet smelling aroma. Now when I go home after I work a long hard day, my son is in the back usually barbecuing when I come up and drive up into the, up into the parking lot or in the parking lot, driveway. And, and as I get out, I smell that. And I think, ooh, supper, that's good stuff, you know. That smells really good. And all our neighbors say the same thing. You know, oh, man, that smells good. But you see, that's what he's talking about. Something, a love that satisfies. A love that, that quenches your hunger. A love that, that you, can't, you can't exchange it for anything. It's just something that God has given us. And so we see that, that an offering of sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 says very simply, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You see, these people had been the people, the Romans had been thought about giving themselves as sacrifices. And Paul says, no, God doesn't want dead Christians. He wants living Christians that are living for Christ, living for God. So we're, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I like the way the NIV puts it, which is your spiritual worship, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices. Verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? By reading the word. By reading the word. By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Beloved, we are to live our lives. We are to live our lives in the love of God. We are to live for Jesus. Back in Ephesians in verses 3 through 7, we see the avoidance of lewdness. In verse 3 through 5, the conditions of sin. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not even be named among you as it is fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Oh, this is what they used to live like. Paul says, I don't want you to be involved in that lifestyle anymore. We need to change our lifestyle. We see the participation of the profane. Too many Christians are allowing themselves to walk in the world. Too many Christians, I mean to tell you, we are inundated in our life with the thoughts of the profane and the things of this world, folks. We need to be careful. Be careful what you watch. Oh, it's hard. Really, it is. There's not hardly anything you can watch today without seeing something nasty in it. There's not a whole lot. Is it any wonder that our world is the way it is today? We see we're not to participate in the profane. Again, if I, I can't tell you in, in, in mixed company, all the things that these people used to be involved in, in their religion, they would stop off after work by the, by the, uh, the temple and get involved with the female and the male priests and, priest and, uh, uh, priests and priestesses and have fornication with them and then go home. Paul says, you don't stop by the temple anymore before you go home. You stay away from that place. Listen, folks, the things of this world can cause us to get involved in it. We see the participation of the profane in Colossians. Turn a little bit to Colossians to your right. You go past Philippians and you go to Colossians chapter 3, and starting with verse 5. Excuse me, starting with verse, uh, yeah, verse 5. Colossians 3, verse 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Paul saying to the Colossians, I know what you did in the temple. I know what you did in those temples. And we don't need to do that anymore. So that you want to stop by and get involved once more. He said, that, that's ridiculous. Stay out of those places. Walk with Christ. And that's the way we ought to do it right now. Folks, listen, let me tell you the easiest way is simply this. You say to yourself, Lord, that's not me anymore. That's not what I'm to be anymore. And you walk away. We see in verse 5 the pronouncement of punishment. Back in Ephesians chapter 5, we see the pronouncement of punishment. The Bible says, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetousness man, covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now what he's saying is people who live like this, who have a lifestyle like this, who literally live this way all their life. This is not what they are to do. They will not go to heaven. So we see in verse, in verse 5, we see the pronouncement of punishment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verse 9, 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verse 9. The Bible teaches us, as Paul writes to the church at Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and by the way, the church of Corinthians was probably the most uh, uh, craziest church that you could ever be a part of. It was so carnal. In 1 Corinthians 6, starting with verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You see, God says very simply, there's not a sin in this world that I can't forgive. There's not a sin in the world. Here he's saying to the Corinthians, as you once were. And all of this was done in the name of religion. All of this was done in the name of their false gods. Paul said this is as some of you once were. Then we go to verse 6 and 7, we see the condemnation of sinners. In verse 6, the wrath of God, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Listen, folks, you've got a brain in your head and you have a soul in your body. Each and every one of us has a soul. I call the soul that each and every one of us had, had that God literally, as David said, he literally knit me in my mother's womb. This old body you and I have, we're going to discard it one day. It's going to be gone. The real you is inside, that soul. That soul lives forever. It is what I call the fingerprint of God in your life. God knit that soul in the body of that baby there in your mother's womb and literally you have within you that soul that lives forever. And what we see here, the wrath of God in verse 6 literally says, comes upon the sons of disobedience. And that's because that soul chooses to live in disobedience, to not follow the things of God. In Revelation chapter 20 in verse 15 it says, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the last judgment. That's the great white throne judgment. If your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, then you're cast into the lake of fire. Verse 7, we see the warning of God back in Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Oh, listen, folks. God says, get away from them. The Bible says, stay away from them. Don't participate with them. We see the warning of God. He's writing to the saints of God. Don't get involved with this. 2 Corinthians 6, 15 says, And what accord has Christ with Belial at Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What we see here, folks, we don't, you can't hide yourself from unbelievers. You go to work tomorrow, you're going to be with unbelievers. That's, that's, that doesn't mean you literally put a bubble around you, walk around bumping into people. Hey, I don't want, don't touch me. I'm okay. You know, you don't, there's only so many masks you can wear, folks. <laughs> there's only many, so many things you can do. You can't inoculate yourself from sin. This is not there. Okay. We're going to be with unbelievers. It's not saying you can't live with them, but what it's saying here in verse seven, don't be partakers with them. Don't get involved in the lifestyle. Don't get involved in the sin. Okay? And so we see we're walking, <clears throat> walking in, in his love. God loves us. He doesn't want us to be like that anymore. He doesn't want us to be involved in those things anymore. And then we see also walking in his light. In verse 8 through 13, we see in verse 8 through 10 a change of direction. When you and I were saved, we had a change in direction. I was an 11-year-old boy when I got saved. Folks, I tell you, the worst thing I did was to steal a cookie out of my grandma's cookie jar when I got saved. I could take that little head of that goat off that cookie jar and not a sound could be heard. I had, 
I had worked that thing out. I could take those cookies. Did you take any cookies, John? No, not me. Crumbs all over my face, you know. But the bottom line was simple. I was doing wrong. Okay? I was doing wrong. And what we see here is this, this change in life. Once I was saved, I changed my life. Now, some of the worst sins I've ever committed happened after I was saved. Once you are saved, folks, that doesn't mean you don't sin. Once you're saved, that doesn't mean you don't get involved in some things that you shouldn't get involved in. As a Christian, let me tell you this very simply. It's easy to trip and fall. I want you to understand that. That's, that's not you doing something. That's something being done to you. You step in a, a hole somewhere. You fall over and fall yourself and Ice on the street. Listen, some of the greatest falls have been since when I get on ice. I don't, I don't wear ice skates. I don't want to ever wear ice skates. I tried it a couple occasions, and no, I don't like those things. But let me say this to you. We don't intentionally fall. We should never choose to follow the evil of this world. But we can fall into sin. And when we fall into sin, the Bible says very simply, this is what we do. The Bible says in 1 John that if you have, if you have, if you say you have no sin, you call God a liar and his love does not live in you. So what we need to understand is in 1 John 1 9 is simple, that if you'll confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Folks, that is the nature of the forgiveness of the believer. Now, what we see here is that we, are ha we have a change of life in verse 8 in chapter 5. For you were once darkness, but you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. This is a change of direction. You have a change in life. Our past positions were simple. We were children of wrath. We walked in darkness. In Ephesians, turn a little bit to the left. In Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, starting verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses of sin. You're saved. Okay? Verse 2. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Paul said, we used to have that life, but we don't need to do it now. We can walk in the light. Our past position, but we see our present uh, pursuit again in verse 8. The Bible says, For we once were dark, we were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Paul said, Don't walk as children of darkness. You don't need to be in that way anymore. You don't need to follow those things. Get that out of your mind. And folks, listen, the best way to do that is very simple. We just ask the Lord, Do you want to go down that way? And the Lord says, No then you say, I don't want to go either. And you don't go. It's as simple as that, really. It's not that difficult. We see our present pursuit is now you are light in the Lord. We are children of light. Isaiah 2.5 says, O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Oh, folks, listen. It's a better walk. It's a sweeter walk. It's a, it's a healthier walk. It's a walk that you'll never stumble or fall. Back in chapter 5 of Ephesians in verse 9 and 10, we see a change in likeness. Look at verse 9. The Bible says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Here Paul writes to the Ephesians. He'd already wrote to the Galatians about the fruit of the Spirit. And now he writes to the Ephesians about the fruit of the Spirit. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is the characteristics of Christ in the believer's life. Now, the Bible didn't say the fruit of the Spirit are. The fruits of the Spirit are. No, it's the fruit of the Spirit is. 
because that's exactly what it is a one big package deal. You don't get them, you know, they down the road and you get one. I'll have a, 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 a give me a, a t-shirt of patience. I'll take one of those, please. And how about some shoes of uh, uh, long suffering? I'll have one. I'll have a pair of those, please. No, you get the whole outfit. You put on the whole armor of God. You put on the whole fruit of the Spirit. We see the fruit of the Spirit, again, is the characteristics of Christ in the believer's life. People can say there's something different about you. You walk into a bank, people say there's something different about you. You walk into work and people say there's something different about you. You go shopping, people say there's something different about you. You know why? Because you bear the characteristics of Christ in your life. Oh, folks, that's an important thing to do. We see the fruit of the Spirit in verse 9. Galatians 5. Turn a little bit to your left to Galatians. It's just the next book over. Look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit let us not become conceited provoking one another and envying one another walk in the spirit of God and so we see the fruit of the Spirit in verse 10, back in Ephesians 5, we see the familiarity of the Savior, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Do you want to know what Jesus wants? Do you want to know what Jesus would have you do in your life? Do you want to know where Jesus wants you to go, what Jesus wants you to do? Not that difficult. You just ask him. Read his word. Reveal to me, Lord, where you want me to go. Reveal to me, Lord, how you want my life. Oh, I heard a long time ago, there's an old song talking about I made my Bible into a road map. And the bottom line is simple. If you want to live your life for Christ, read the word. We see the familiarity of the Savior in verse 10. Now, the, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 10, I'll read it to you out of the NIV. It says, and find out what pleases the Lord. Don't you want to know how to please the Lord in your life? You see, that's the whole Christian life. You want to please him. I mean, you think about it. He's saved you. He gave his life for you. He redeemed you from all the tragedies of hell. Don't you want to live for him? Don't you want to know what he wants you to do in your life for him? We see the familiarity of the Lord. Romans 8 and verse 8 and 9 says, So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what we need to understand, folks, there, is, there are two thrones in heaven. One throne, the Spirit of God, is seated upon it. The second throne, there at his right hand, is Jesus seated upon the throne. But why is he saying, when we say we want to receive Christ, we receive the Spirit of Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit. He is our seal, as we see in the first chapter of Ephesians. He's the seal that God has given us to seal us until the day of redemption. So we see that, that we have a change in likeness. We, we have this change of direction. Next, we see a concealing of the darkness. In verse 11 and 12, the darkness of sin disguises. Look at verse 11, a secret conduct. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Paul is talking about here a secret conduct, living a life that nobody else knows about it. He says, get rid of those things. In verse 11, the Bible says, rather expose them. Do not do the unfruitful works of darkness. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 
For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Be careful who you associate with. Be careful who you laugh with. Be careful who you live with. Be careful who you walk with. The Bible says we need to be careful of the darkness. And then in verse 12, we see a shameful concealment. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Oh, folks, there are things out there in this world. You and I are sheltered. I was a sheltered child. My oldest brother drowned when I was a year old. And I had a younger brother die before I was three years old. And what we need to understand is I was sheltered. I mean, my mom and dad never let me do anything as a child. I, I was their last hope. And then my other brother came along, and then it was John who, you know. <laughs> but, but that's a different point, a different story, and i got to work that out with my brother when I get to heaven. But anyway, the bottom line is simple. I, I've forgotten the point I was going to here. The thing is very simple, folks. We need to be careful. We need to live for God. We need to do what we need to do for him because we love him. In verse 12, we see that shameful concealment. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 19, just a page over, if you like my Bible. It says, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But we see here this shameful conduct, this shameful concealment. Stay away from those things, folks. Don't live the life you used to live. In verse 13, we see the light of Scripture discloses. The Bible says, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. That's why the devil does what he does in the darkness. That's why things are done in evil that are done in the darkness, because they think nobody sees. They think nobody cares. But in reality, God sees. Years ago, we had a man who murdered his wife, he was not a member of our church, but he had come into our Sunday school class on several occasions. And his wife was a member of my wife's Sunday school class. She was a member of our church. But this man had had a, a, a relationship with a prostitute. And this prostitute had to take the body of his dead wife out to the, the mall and leave them in a car to be found. Make a long story short, they did not believe the prostitute's testimony. The jury found him not guilty. So when the press came to my pastor, they asked him, what do you think about this, this uh, uh, finding with the, with the jury? He says, listen, he has yet to go to the great judge. We have a judge, folks, one day. We have a judge that's going to judge all the things of the Lord. We know all it. He knows everything, folks. That's why if we cover that, that sin in the blood of Christ, it washes it away. We see here in verse 11 through 13 a, con a concealing of darkness. Again, the darkness of sin disguises, but in verse 13, the light of Scripture discloses. It reveals the deception of sin in verse 13, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. It reveals the destruction of sin. The Bible says, for whatever makes manifest is light. Hebrews 3.13, we see, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Finally, in verse 14, the Bible says, therefore he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. We see in this scripture in verse 14, the Apostle Paul now directs the Ephesians and all those who want to walk in Christ's light to come first to Christ's love, his salvation. We see again in verse 14, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. 
In 1 John 1, 7, it says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, that's the unique thing about the blood of Christ. Every sin, every sin we have ever committed has been forgiven by God. Salvation is God's remedy. Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Salvation is God's result because it become a child of God. Believe and accept his salvation. And Christ will give you light. John 1, 12 and 13 says, But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, that's the unique thing, folks. If you're born again, you are a child of God. Your sins have been forgiven. Every last one of them. It's a package deal. You know why? They were all future sins at the cross. You weren't even born yet. You had not even committed one of those sins. But Jesus took your sins and my sins upon the cross and died for them almost 2,000 years ago so that you and I could be free from the penalty of sin. Come now to Christ and be saved, as the scriptures would tell us. And therein lies the issue, folks, for the Ephesians and for you and me, that we are to walk as children of light. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures, Father, and how important it is that we read and apply and walk in them that we walk the path that Christ has provided for us, that we may not walk in darkness, but walk in the light. Be with each and every one of us, Father, for those who are saved and those who aren't saved. Help us to remember to walk in the light. And for those who are without Christ, let them come to the light. Jesus loves them. Jesus died for them. Jesus gave his life to forgive them of every sin ever committed. And, oh, Father God, be with those who are here tonight and those who are watching on YouTube, that they might come to Christ. Help us to understand, Father, we're all sinners. We're all in that same boat. And the tragedy is the boat is sinking. Death is coming. But Jesus died on that cross to give them life everlasting. And for those of us who receive Christ, he's given us the life, uh, the life preserver as we sit in this boat because death will come, but Jesus has given us life. And, oh, Father God, be with those who need this salvation, that need this forgiveness. Help them to pray something like this and mean it in their hearts. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I confess my sins and repent of them. But now I realize, Jesus, you're the Son of God, and you died for my sins and rose from the dead to give me life everlasting. I believe this, Jesus. And now I ask you to come into my heart, forgive my sins, cleanse me from my iniquity. And give me eternal life. And for the rest of my life, Jesus, I'll live for you. Thank you, Lord. As we continue in prayer, Father God, be with those that prayed that prayer. Help them to make that decision public, whether here in the, in the service or there on YouTube to speak to a family member or friend. Oh, Lord, be with us tonight. Let your will be done, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. and our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 109 
26 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Bless be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship.